Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our webinar, a cooperation between Erlanga Hospital and also Lingku Changbung Memorial Hospital, and also supported by Bulan. I would like to introduce myself. My name is Briastami Sawitri. I'm a psychiatrist in Universitas Erlanga Hospital, and I am very honored to be your host for today. First, I would like to welcome our delegation from Taiwan, from Lingko Changbung Memorial Hospital. We have Professor Jacob C. Tong Pang Feng, a Vice Superintendent of Changbung Hospital. And also we have Ms. Jenny Huang. And also we would like to welcome Dr. Chun Wen Cheng, medical doctor, clinical infectious disease expert. And also, I would like to welcome you all on behalf of our director of Universitas Erlanga Hospital to everybody who has joined our webinar for today. For, the, for today, we will have a welcome speech, an opening remark by Professor Jeff Tong and also followed by our vice director, Dr. Imam Subadi, MD Physiatrist, who will be giving you an opening remark on behalf of Professor Dr. Nasrin M, the internist, our director. And then I would like to give Dr. Rahmania Pramanasari, plastic surgeon. We will have four. Uh, material for today, an introduction of Changbung International Medical from Ms. Jenny Hu, and also uh, we will have um, an expert who will explain to you from Changbung Memorial Hospital preparedness to prevent nosocomial and introduction of prevention during COVID-19 in Taiwan. And then from our hospital, we have Dr. Pastuti Astawulaningro, pulmonologist, will give you an update management of COVID patient in RSU uh, UA in our hospital. And also Dr. Prihatma Chris Widiat Tomo, an anesthesiologist who will give you and explain about the ER management during pandemic, the challenge and experience. We will be followed by discussion for another 20 minutes before we will have a photo session on our last um, session for today. So um, before we proceed, um, we wish you will have a very great webinar. And for the first welcome speech, I would like to give the time for Professor Jacob C. Tong Pang, the Vice Superintendent of Lingko Changbung Memorial Hospital. For Professor Jacob, the time is yours. Uh, dear friends uh, in Indonesia and uh, all the audience uh, online, it is our great pleasure to uh, have a conference uh, together with uh, experts in Indonesia. And it's really uh, our opportunity, great opportunity to communicate with you uh, during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic time. Uh, I hope that uh, during this conference, we can exchange our experience. Professor Jacob? <laughs> Can you hear me? Ah, uh, if you have, we have a few minutes to give an opening remark for Professor Jacob. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Professor. Okay, uh, so uh, first of all, uh, I'd like to uh, thank for, uh, our Indonesian friends. Uh, uh, that can uh, give us this opportunity to meet with you uh, online and to give a, a discussion together with you about the COVID-19 prevention. I think uh, this is a time that uh, we're all suffer a lot from this pandemic. Uh, hopefully, uh, during our discussion, we can share our experience and find a better way to help people to fight for this uh, pandemic. And uh, I uh, really want to thanks again for all the 
helped and all the uh, good job that you have done to make this uh, conference uh, uh, successful. And uh, I hope that uh, in the coming discussion, we will all enjoy and we all can learn from each other. So I will uh, I wish you all the best and, and we hope that uh, this will be a successful meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Jacob. We are very sorry about the uh, technical difficulties over here, but I will be honored to give uh, Dr. Imam Subadi, our physiatrist, our vice director of Universitas Erlangga Hospital, to give a welcome speech. Please, Dr. Imam, the time is yours. Uh, honorable Vice Superintendent of Linkau Changkung Memorial Hospital, Professor Jacob C. Tampang, uh, speakers from Taiwan and from Indonesia, and moderator and audience. First of all, I would like to inform you that the cases in our city, Surabaya, of COVID-19 literally increase. Yes. It's about uh, 400 cases a day in each Java. In our hospital, we have spirited buildings uh, to care of COVID, uh, between COVID-19 cases and non-COVID. And in our hospital, COVID cases is dominant. There are increase, uh, decrease of 40% left of non-COVID. Uh, currently, we take care, of, take care of 60 COVID-19 patients and uh, next week, we will increase the capacity uh, until 80. In our hospital, the capacity uh, of beds is about 137 for COVID patients. And our current problem is human resources, uh, especially nurses. So we really support this event so we can exchange ideas about the management of handling COVID-19 and the impact and the risks to health workers. I hope this meeting beneficial to patients and people in two countries. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Imam Subaidi, um, a physiatrist, and also I uh, would like to introduce you to our lovely moderator for today. She will be sharing this discussion for today, Dr. Rahmaniar Pramanasari, a plastic surgeon. So, Dr. Rahmaniar, time is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Biastami. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and also our honorable speakers. My name is Dr. Rahma. I'm a plastic surgeon from Universal Sarlanga Hospital. And I will be the moderator for this afternoon session, uh, cross nation COVID 19 sharing session between Unukta Salanga Hospital and Changgeng Memorial Hospital with the topic of management during pandemic, challenge, and experience. As we know, uh, Taiwan now has already an uncontrolled phase uh, in local transmitted of COVID 19. And also on last October 2020, uh, Taiwan uh, has celebrated. 200 days without new cases. Uh, until now, they are still uh, on control phase of the new COVID-19 cases. So today we will get to know on how uh, Taiwan can came up with the strategy and the prevention of the COVID-19. Uh, we will have four speakers for this afternoon and we will have discussion afterward after, after all speakers have presented their presentations. So if there's any question you would like to ask, you may uh, drop your question on the 
chat section below and we will discuss it afterwards. For our first speaker will be Miss Jenny Wang, a marketing manager from Linko, Linko Changgeng International Medical Center. We'll be presenting introduction of Changgeng International Medical for 20 minutes to Miss Wang. The time is yours. Okay, now we will share our PPT to you. Uh, can you see our PPT? Is it clear? Yes, clear. Okay. Uh, hello, dear friends from Indonesia. I'm Jimmy Hong from Changgen Hospital. Also represent the International Medical Center to introduce our hospital. And my introduction will be divided into three parts. First, I will introduce our hospital and our history. And then I'll share with you of our some of center of excellence. Then I would like to share with you some international patient in our hospital. So first, uh, our hospital was founded by Mr. Wang Yongqing and Mr. Wang Yongzai in 1974. They are also the founder of Formosa Plastic Group. They founded this hospital to memorize their father, Mr. Wang Changgen, because he was he passed away because he did not get appropriate medical care at that time. This hospital had a lot of improve of Taiwanese medical quality a lot with lots of actual contribution. So nowadays, totally we have eight branches in Taiwan, uh, including the nursing home to the healthcare village. Now we are located in Chang, uh, Linko branch, which is the largest branch in Taiwan. Okay, about the visiting scholar and international fellow. In 2016 to 2018, uh, we totally received more than 800 people came from all around the world. More than 68 countries came to Chang'an to study advanced medical technique. So to continue this topic, I'm going to introduce some center of excellence of our hospital. The first one is the liver transplantation. Our hospital finished the first liver transplantation in 1984 by Mr. Chen Zhaolong and his team. Now we have the world's highest survival rate, which is more than 91%. We already complete more than 3,000 cases right now and trained more than 300 liver transplantation doctors from various countries. And this is a photo of our liver transplantation team. And Okay, next one. This one is the proton therapy. Proton therapy is kind of an advanced technique to treat tumor. And our hospital owned the first and second proton therapy center. One is in Linko branch and another is in Kaohsiung branch. Uh, a lot of international patients choose to come to our hospital because of proton therapy. Proton therapy compared to traditional radiation therapy, it cut down a lot of side effects especially for children, they have benefits for this. And we already treat more than 2,300 cases in our hospital. Uh, take the famous tennis player, Mr. Li Zongwei from Malaysia, for example. He chose our hospital to treat his carcinoma here and he have a well uh, recovery right now. Okay, and our hospital is also famous with our total solution and multiple discipline collaboration. Take the liver cancer, for example. In our hospital, we have proton therapy, immune therapy, and target therapy, also the radiation frequency application. Our doctor will consider a patient's situation and discuss with the patient the most appropriate treatment plan. 
uh, our hospital also have the largest cold blood transportation center in Taiwan, which complete more than 147 cases right now. With uh, according to the data uh, of the five year survival rate, our survival rate is uh, more than 88%. And the data can compare with the top university hospital in the United States. Okay. Then we'll go to come to the next part of our famous uh, plastic and reconstruction department. Uh, in our hospital, we treat primary and secondary lymphedema with the successful rate more than 98%. And more than 97% of patients are very happy with their result. You can see in the picture, their legs appearance did change a lot. Okay, then next one is the craniofacial reconstruction. We treat cleft lift, also the craniosynotosis surgery, which reshape the head shape of the children and make their brain have the enough shape to grow. Also, we have ear reconstruction here that work, uh, the plastic surgeon can work with the ENT surgeon to, to rebuild their hearing, uh, hearing function, also the appearance of the children's ear. Uh, due to the medical technique and high quality of care in our hospital, in 90, uh, 2019, of course, before COVID-19, we have uh, about uh, 30,000 visits here came to our hospital. Most, uh, most international patients are from China and also from Southeast Asia, Hong Kong, Macau, United States, Europe, and Northeast Asia, in, in all around the world. Move on to the next part. I'm gonna share some page, international patients story here. Okay. You see a picture here. This is a Malaysian girl who suffered from lymphedema and he was undergo the treatment from Dr. Zheng Minghui and his team. After the surgery, he can, she's very happy with the result and she can only wear shorts before the surgery. Now she can wear pants. So she was very happy. This is a Chinese little boy, one year old Chinese boy who has suffered from a facial tumor, which is more than 60 M. After a four hour surgery of a um, cranial facial team, he can finally smile and eat again. Look at his adorable picture. And this one is a very severe case from Pakistan, whose name is Bibi. Uh, Bibi have a very se uh, severe facial problem. Uh, she chose to come to our hospital and after two operation by our cranial facial team, BB, uh, the BB's appearance did improve a lot. You can see in the picture. Okay, the next story is about an uh, Egyptian fellow. This Egyptian fellow came to our hospital to learn medical technique. After he go back to Egypt, he referred his own father to our hospital to receive liver transplant as himself as a donor. And this is a picture he took with our medical team and doctor at that time. Due to our reputation of our hospital, National Geographic and Discovery make a documentary in a hospital in 2012 and 2014. And I'll share one of the story with you. It's about Dr. Solomon, an Egyptian surgeon, and he was hurt by the bullet on his hand. So he, is a, he was very afraid of he cannot uh, operation anymore. So he came to our hospital to seek medical assistance from Dr. Wei Fu Quan. And Dr. Wei Fu Quan is one of the top surgeons in this field. After Dr. Wei Fu Quan and his team conduct a toe to hand joint transportation, uh, Dr. Solomon can go back to his hospital and conduct an uh, operation after six months. Okay, and this is the end of my introduction today. Hope you have a brief concept of our hospital and please enjoy the rest of the session. Thank you. Thank you very much to Ms. Wong for your presentations. Our next speaker will be Dr. Chun Wen Cheng from Clinical Infectious Disease at Changgung Memorial Hospital. We'll be presenting Changgung Memorial Hospital Preparedness to Prevent Nosocomial and introduction of prevention during COVID-19 in Taiwan for 20 minutes. To Dr. Cheng, the time is yours.
Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, can you see the presentation PPT? Brother Chang? Yes, uh, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Okay, uh, we want to share the presentation. Can you see the presentation PPT? Yes, already, Dr. Chang. <clears throat> you may proceed. <clears throat> Okay, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Chen. I'm an uh, infectious disease specialist. In my part, I want to introduce uh, the hospital preparedness to prevent the COVID-19 uh, nosocomial outbreak in hospital. At the first, uh, I want to introduce uh, the current epidemic information in Taiwan. The COVID-19 started from China uh, in late 2019. So uh, our first case in Taiwan was in the January uh, 2020. So in January and February, the major cases are from China. And those imported cases also cause a, a little locally transmitted cases in Taiwan. We come from a major uh, cases since uh, 2020 March. That's the first wave of the pandemic. So we have a lot of imported cases on March and April 2020. And Taiwan started a very uh, strict border control so everyone uh, should be quarantined for 14 days after the immigration. And we tested for all visitors with symptoms. And we also had a very strict contact tracing policy for every confirmed cases. And we, in Taiwan, every confirmed case will be transferred to hospital until their PCR test are negative. So, so after the very strict border control, contact tracing policies, our COVID-19 case uh, markedly dropped since April. So uh, till now we are, we have zero locally acquired cases since April. There are only sporadic imported cases. So um, there is no massive community spreading COVID-19 in Taiwan. So I want to share our hospital's experience in the February, March, the massive imported cases occurred in Taiwan, how we do the infection control to prevent the nosocomial spreading. So totally we have over 1700 cases in Taiwan and only seven deaths. The two major strategy to prevent uh, the nosocomial infection of COVID-19 is to prevent the viral transmission from community and to prevent the viral spreading in the hospital. And the most important is to do a traffic control of patient. So this is the timeline of the uh, confirmed cases in Taiwan and in our hospital. The blue bar is the daily cases in Taiwan. And the red color, green color, and the yellow color is the confirmed cases in Chang'an Memorial Hospital. So we have our first case in, in February 20. So before, before the epidemic in Taiwan, we started a preparation since very early of the, the epidemic. So our hospital set up a, a response team, a responsive team uh, since uh, January 3. And we established this, this SOP of patient care uh, about the, and also the uh, personal protective equipment wearing protocols. And we start to, and several rehearsal 
of the PBE uh, and the disease education for all staff. Excuse me, Dr. Cheng. Yes. Uh, unfortunately, your slide is not on slideshow, so uh, maybe you would like to uh, slideshow your slide first because the slide is not working currently. So uh, you cannot see the graph. Uh, it's only your, uh, it's not on slideshow yet, so maybe you can set it to okay. slideshow. Okay, I, I, want, I, I will sh share the slide again. Okay, I share the slide again. Uh, can you see it? Okay. It's not full screen, right? Yes. On the bottom right of your slide. Okay, okay, okay. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Okay. 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 Uh, sorry about the technical problem. So, um, okay, so we, we start a very early preparation about the uh, infection control measures and the PBE, the standard of PBE in our hospital. And we uh, also start a rehearsal in the high risk area, high risk uh, unit. And um, the first case in Taiwan, after the first case in Taiwan, we started to do a entrance triage. The, the triage is to screen the uh, potentially infected cases to prevent the infected case directly come into the hospital and contact the other patients or the other healthcare workers. So we started, we call the entrance uh, TOCC triage. And we set up an outdoor quarantine station at our ER. And this patient control policy uh, include the triage before entering the hospital. And we also separate the infected patient uh, from the other patients in the hospital. And the, at the every entrance of our hospital, uh, we detect the temperature of every visit. And we also check the traveling history of every visitors. Because in the early uh, epidemic, all the, most of the uh, COVID-19 cases are imported cases. So their immigration history are very important to us and we can uh, access their immigration data by reading the everyone's healthcare ins health insurance card. And we also uh, ask uh, any respiratory symptom, any cluster or any contact history at the entrance. So um, we call the TOCC and uh, our respiratory symptom checkup at the entrance. So if anyone who had relevant uh, traveling history, relevant symptoms, he will not be allowed to enter the hospital. So we will direct them to epidemic clinic for those with mild symptoms. And uh, the others with severe symptoms such as fever, such as uh, respiratory distress, will be directed to the ER outdoor quarantine station. So we set up the epidemic clinic at the corner of our hospital building. And there is an uh, independent entrance, independent uh, air conditioning. And this area is physically uh, separated from other, uh, other clinic in our hospital. So um, for those with symptoms, uh, those patients with symptoms, they will enter this clinic 
and to uh, they also can receive the radiographic checkup and the virus checkup at this this area. So to prevent the infected patient contact with other patients. And this is our uh, outdoor quarantine station uh, at our at our ER. So for those with symptoms, uh, patient with symptoms, they will, can be evaluated uh, at the outdoor quarantine station, including the uh, chest X-ray, the viral testing, and the physical exam uh, at, at this area. So um, we after we start the patient traffic control policies, we also uh, did some policy to prevent the nosocomia spreading. Uh, that means we have to uh, separate the high-risk patient from other patients in the hospital. And we also have to early identify uh, any symptomatic inpatients. So we set up, uh, we call a fever monitoring panel. It's an business intelligence policies. So we can monitor uh, the, the fever patients in our whole hospital. And we also set up an expert team that include uh, infectious disease specialist and a pulmonologist. The, the, the expert team, the expert team, we can uh, timely uh, evaluate any inpatients with pneumonia. And we, we also uh, subdivided our staff into different uh, a different group. For example, um, we divided our staff in the general surgeon, general surgery state, the department that can be divided into group A, group B, and group C. And these subdivisions um, can prevent uh, so the staff, viral transmission between staff. So group A, group B, and group C, they work at, at different stations use different offices. So uh, if the patient at the outdoor quarantine station and he need hospitalization for further treatment, so we have a patient flow. So we separate the high-risk patient from the low-risk patients. So every patient, uh, he had respiratory symptoms or he had pneumonia or any contact history with confirmed cases we will transfer them to the isolation ward or the quarantine ward. So they have to do the PCR test uh, at the isolation or quarantine ward. And they can be transferred to the general ward if the COVID-19 infection was excluded. So this is a, a one-way process for the patients uh, with pneumonia. So everyone, every care worker in the isolation world or in the quarantine world, they have to wear a standard PPE and the N95 respirator mask. And this is our design uh, for the isolation and the quarantine world. And the healthcare workers were all deep or uh, independent between the two working areas. And every healthcare worker have to um, follow our recommendation for PPEs. And the recommendation is, uh, uh, is based on the, their, the risk of their uh, daily activities. So if they have any risk of contacting patient's blood, body fluid, or they are taking the nasal pharyngeal swab or respiratory symptoms, or oh, they have uh, some erosive generating procedures. Uh, so for, for example, for this with high risk contact, they have to wear a standard PPE. And this is our, uh, our clinical teams cabin in the summary. So uh, they won't contact with each other. The group A and group B and group C, they are all independent uh, working group. So our triage and the entrance can uh, screen the patients with symptoms, but we know COVID-19 uh, 
may transmit can be transmitted if, if the even the patient is asymptomatic. So we have to uh, do a real time, a re very fast response to the inpatient fever or inpatient with pneumonia. So our hospital had an, uh, we call the fever monitoring panels. So our ID uh, can uh, monitor the, the fever patient in our hospital. So from the panel, we can identify the geographic distribution of the patients and we can evaluate their symptoms uh, and their, their uh, chest images and uh, any, uh, to evaluate if they have any risk of COVID-19. So from this fever panel, we can daily monitor in our fever patients. And for every inpatient pneumonia, if, if the physicians have, um, have any questions and any suspicions of, for the COVID-19, they can contact our expert team immediately. So every patient with symptoms, uh, we can uh, do the PCR test immediately. So we also uh, have a very strict visitor restriction during the pandemic era. We also set up an outdoor pharmacy to prevent uh, the, the patient influx. And we also have a daily health surveillance for our staff. We ask our staff to report their body temperature and uh, to report their, uh, if they have any respiratory symptoms, uh, they have to report this to uh, every day after their work. So we uh, set up a, a health surveillance app and also uh, they can report it through our health uh, hospital information uh, system. So uh, if anyone who he had a fever or symptoms, we will ask him to stop work and uh, test for the COVID-19 PCRs. And the other uh, transmission route is about the fomite transmission because the virus can stay on the environment for a long time. So uh, we widely set up uh, the alcohol dispenser at every checkpoint in our hospital. So, uh, so if the staff are going from the uh, station A to the station B, I have to do a hand washing before the two station, the checkup point. So uh, this widespread uh, uh, alcohol dispenser can prevent the, the fomite transmission. So um, in the early pandemic, we have two inpatients diagnosed in Chang'an Memorial Hospital. And we have three health healthcare workers, the green line, and they are get infected after taking care of the second inpatient. But uh, we reinforcement our health, our inpatient control policies after the event. So we can see uh, since March and April, the, uh, the, uh, the COVID-19 cases in Chang'an Memorial Hospital were all diagnosed at our ER quarantine station. And there is no more uh, nosocomial clustering or nosocomial spreading of the hospital. So um, this, this, these are our major infection control uh, policies during this pandemic. So uh, we will continue these policies, even though there's no um, uh, massive community spreading of COVID-19 in Taiwan. But I think um, the situation might be different uh, between Indi Indonesia and Taiwan. Um, so we don't have massive community cases now, but if we have uh, rapid increasing cases such as in Indonesia, Indonesia, our hospital will activate another caring system. They have some uh, designated hospital to take care of COVID-19 cases if there are massive cases in Taiwan. So all the COVID-19 cases will be uh, transferred to the special hospitals. So currently uh, we'll continue these two major policies to preserve our healthcare, 
healthcare power and uh, um, to prevent, uh, to preserve our, our healthcare workers' health. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Chen, for your presentations. Our next speaker will be Dr. Prastuti Astawulaningrum, pulmonologist from Universitas Erlangga Hospital. We'll be presenting management of COVID in Universitas Erlangga Hospital. To Dr. Prastuti, the time is yours. Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I am I'm Prasuti. I am the pulmonologist uh, who's taking care of COVID in Unar Hospital. Uh, today I'm going to present the update of our COVID management in Unar Hospital. Uh, first, I want to uh, I want to relay about our patient screening. The screening in our hospital consists of three different screenings, which is from outpatient clinic and COVID emergency room and non-COVID emergency room. So we have two different uh, emergency room here, uh, so that we can separate between the COVID and non-COVID patients. In the outpatient clinic, we, ha we have uh, our own radiology, uh, chest x-ray or CT scan, and we, we will provide a PCR, real-time PCR for the patient, especially for ones uh, which needs a surgeries or which needs a uh, further treatment. And we have a serology uh, lab too, so that we can uh, provide them, uh, is it a COVID or non-COVID patient? From the outpatient clinic, we will divide them into COVID or non-COVID. It doesn't delay the treatment given to the patient. It's just that if the patient is COVID, then we will refer them to the, our separate building. If it's non-COVID patient, then uh, the patient uh, will be in the non-COVID wings. In the, no in the COVID emergency room, we will provide a radiology examination, a a chest x-ray or CT scan, serology, and we will still depend on a clinical finding. And this COVID emergency room, uh, we receive a referral patient too from the other hospital. Uh, this hospital has been a referral hospital, a top referral hospital for the COVID patients. So all of the patients from the other regions of the East Java will come to our hospital aside from the uh, Dr. Sutomo Hospital. And the other COVID, uh, the other emergency room is a non-COVID emergency room, which we can uh, provide a radiology to, serology, and clinical findings. So uh, this COVID and non-COVID ER uh, has two different rooms, two different, they, they lie in the different building. So it is very perfectly safe. Uh, if, if the patient is non-COVID, then we will uh, refer them to the non-COVID wings. This is our government uh, guideline that all patients present with the COVID symptoms must be treated accordingly until proven otherwise or non-COVID. This is our uh, guidelines in this hospital. When these patients arrive, uh, they will go either to outpatient clinic or the COVID emergency room or non-COVID emergency room. Uh, in the outpatient clinic, we will divide them into COVID or non-COVID. If it's a uh, COVID, then he will go straight to the isolation ward, uh, which comprise of 139 beds. Um, in the non-COVID rooms, we have uh, non-isolation beds, uh, 100, oh, sorry, this is uh, reversed, 215 beds. And 
if the patient is not certain yet, then we will place them in the buffer room. In the COVID ER, then uh, we will separate them between the, is it a regular sep uh, isolation room or the patient needs an ICU or a uh, high care units. In the non-COVID ER, uh, we will divide patient into a non-isolation room or a buffer room. This buffer room is uh, some kind of uh, um, in-between room where uh, the patient needs to be checked for the PCR. The PCR, if it's a negative, then he will go to the non-COVID or non-isolation room. If it's a PCR positive, then he will go straight to the COVID or isolation room. Our treatment uh, divided into three different categories. Uh, the mud, uh, if, uh, in the ER, we will screen uh, them into chest x-ray. Is it pneumonia or not? What about the D-dimer? Is it high or low? Uh, CRP, liver and kidney function, electrolyte, ECG, or sometimes uh, uh, blood sugar or anything that we, we suspect them to have. What about the vitamin? Uh, what about the therapy? If it's some mild symptoms, then we, we will only give them a vitamins or symptomatic drugs, and they can stay at home. Uh, because the overwhelming amount of COVID patients in our region, then it is not possible to contain them in the hospital. Although we have a emergency hospital that is ready to take a patient, but it's, such, uh, it's currently not always available for a uh, positive patient. For the moderate patient, uh, the screening is uh, containing all the above and including blood gas analysis or CT scan if we are <coughs> needing, uh, if we are needing them. What about the therapy? This moderate patient uh, must be hospitalized. We, we give them antiviral drug, uh, we have uh, oseltamivir, remdesivir, avigan, and so on for the patient. Antibacterials when it's needed, corticosteroids when it's needed, or if there is a, a, a ARDS, and the anticoagulants. We, we definitely need to get anticoagulants because uh, the, the patient usually have this uh, very high ferritin level and d divers And bronchodilators are needed too. The severe patient uh, screening, we are using all the above and the blood gas analysis and CT scan when it is necessary. So the, the severe patient is usually goes straight to the ICU. And robotherapy, all of the moderate therapy are being implemented and ventilators when it is needed. IPIG and plasma convalescent is uh, now uh, uh, is now permitted by the uh, by the government. This is the current situation of COVID in Unar Hospital in the early November. Uh, the ICU patient is twenty one male and fifteen female. The mortality rate is very high. 16 of them died, 12 of them recovered, and eight of them in, inpatient, still, still uh, in treatment. The very high fatality rate in the, uh, in the ICU because all of the patients that are being referred to our facility is very, very severe. And, and most of them die within 48 hours uh, in our treatment. Our patient with a ventilator is, that death is almost 100%. Very, very high. Okay, this is the recovery rate. Uh, 
the, the recovered patient is still very, very low. And this is our mortality rate in November, very high. This is the highest mortality rate in our hospital during our, uh, our participation in COVID management, 24.43%. This is really high, the highest rate in, the November, uh, in, the, in our history in taking care of the patient. We made an assessment uh, according to the mortality rate. The increasing trend of mortality rate is unavoidable since the patient being referred is in a very severe clinical symptoms. Despite our current medical approaches and swift medic, uh, diagnostic tools, we are still losing. Um, for your information, uh, the, the, the length of stay in our, uh, the length of uh, stay in our ER, or COVID ER is very, very long because there is not enough beds. There is not enough beds. Uh, patient keeps coming and it's very, very overwhelming that we have to treat them in the ER. We have to treat them uh, with the everything possible in the ER and it's very hard. Analysis again. Current situation, second outbreak. We are calling this a second outbreak because there is a, a first outbreak and then the second outbreak. This is due to the human mobilization during prolonged public holiday. We have a very long public holiday recently, before November. So um, we are having the second outbreak right now. And more of that, they have a pandemic fatigue where people start to go outside and abandoning health protocols. And it's everywhere. People are abandoning health protocols everywhere. Healthcare facilities uh, are starting to get overwhelmed by the number of patients and the complexities of cases. Because we, I, have to, I have to brief you for a moment. We have, we, we had had our uh, healthcare workers before, during the first <coughs> outbreak, but those healthcare workers has, are now being dismissed because the case uh, back then is starting to decrease, but it is now starting to increase again, and we are having a trouble because of that. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Rastuti. Uh, for the presentations. And uh, our last speaker will be Dr. Prihatma, uh, Chris Widiatomo, anesthesiologist from Universitas Selangor Hospital, will be presenting ER management during pandemic challenge and experience. To Dr. Prihatma, the time is yours. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Sudah Ustaz Nun, uh, everybody. Uh, my name is Priyatma Tersidatomo. I am the head of the emergency department uh, Universitas Erlangga Hospital. Uh, let me share my screen. Not yet. Uh, Pak Sandi, bisa dilihatkan screen-nya, zoom-nya. Sudah dari sini, Pak. Oke. Okay. Oke. Okay. Let me start my presentation. Oke, okay. now I will explain the strategy or the transformation of the emergency department of the Air Universitas Erlaga Hospital to face the COVID-19 pandemics. As you can see from the Dr. Pasuti uh, presentation, the situation of the COVID-19 pandemic in Indonesia, especially in Surabaya, is so bad. Uh, before I start my presentation, maybe um, uh, doctor and uh, my friend from the Taiwan would like to know, actually, where is the Universitas Erlangga Hospital is? <laughs> 
This is the Indonesian map. As you know, um, maybe um, you know this place. This is Jakarta. Jakarta is our capital city of Indonesia. And then there is a very, very beautiful island in Indonesia. Famous island, there's Bali Island. And Surabaya is located between both of them. And um, Surabaya is the second largest city in Indonesia. The first one is Jakarta. Yeah, so this is our hospital. This is Universitas Erlangga Hospital. It is a university hospital. Um, this is our uh, building. We have two buildings there. And then I'd like to show, this is our regular emergency ward or our regular emergency department before the pandemics. We only use this one emergency department to handle the emergency patients. But because of the problem of, because of the pandemic of the COVID-19, uh, we gradually transform uh, our emergency department services. The first one, it is a regular emergency department, this one, and then we transform into the extended one emergency department. We move to the extended two emergency department, and then the last, we clone and transform our hospital into two emergency department. So now we have two emergency department. There is a regular emergency department and also COVID-19 special emergency department. As you can see, this is our first uh, isolation room in our emergency department before the pandemics, before the pandemics. So this is a negative pressure isolation room. There is two beds capacity. It has only one other room and use it uh, usually for tuberculosis patients. This is the, our only uh, one isolation room in emergency department before the pandemic come. Unfortunately, this little harmful thing comes to Indonesia, this one, and you can see the Surabaya is a dark red area. It's a red zone area for the COVID-19 uh, there is a lot of cases, a lot of victims, and a lot of casualties here. So, facing this, first, we built this extended emergency department. We built, um, because we don't have any uh, negative pressure isolation room, so we put it out there with the um, out, outdoor, uh, outdoor work for emergency department extended. This is. But unfortunately, the COVID-19 cases is increasing fast. Um, the casualties, uh, the cases is uh, increasing fast. The victims is everywhere. So we have to transform our emergency department services into this one. So we built emergency department ward two. Unfortunately, this condition is only several, it's only a few days. Several days later, our extended emergency department ward two become like this. It's like a what it? It's very, very crowded with the COVID-19 patients. So we, um, on the March or the May 2020, we don't have uh, another room to handle this patient. And then sometimes we, if we lack of oxygen, we use this. We use the oxygen concentrator. Uh, it because it is portable uh, and it can, it can give five liter per minute oxygen. So maybe it can give about the 40% of uh, oxygen fraction. And finally, because the lot of cases increasing fast, finally we clone our hospital. From basic, we have only regular hospital. We clone our hospital into this one. There is a special building for COVID-19. And there is also special building for non-COVID-19. What I mean by cloning? This is our sim of our old sim of um, our hospital. Mm, wait, on the old design of our hospital, there is a building A and there is a building B. For the building A, almost all the uh, healthcare facilities in here. There is an emergency department. There is a radiology. There is a um, laboratory. There is a ward. 
There's a ICU, ICCU, Intensive Cardiac Care Unit, and ICU, Neonatal Intensive Care Unit, Operating Theater, and so on. And the building B, there is only a ward. There's a ward there. But this is a new design of our building our, after we clone our hospital. There is building A, a special for non-COVID building. There is emergency department. There is a radiology laboratory. There is a ward. There's an ICU, there's an operating theater, and we clone the building B into another hospital. So the building B is a negative pressure isolation building. Almost all of the uh, room or the uh, facilitation on the building B is negative pressure. There's another emergency department. We have our own radiology and laboratory for the COVID. There is a COVID uh, ward, there is ICU for COVID, and Soon, I hope we will have the special operating theater for COVID. Now, the operating theater for COVID is still joined with the with the building A, but soon we will build it uh, in the building B. So, what happened if we have uh, two buildings separated for the COVID and non-COVID? So, we use the COVID-19 pandemics uh, two-step trace protocol for emergency department. So, we use the system. Uh, for trials of the patients uh, come to emergency department of the Universitas Erlangga Hospital. This is the, uh, I mean by the two steps protocol for the COVID-19. So first the patients come to the hospital and then we give the public information. There is a posters or a placard display and also there is a flashing signboard directing patients. There is a security assistant and there is a nurse there to decide whether this patient is come to the building A or building B. So if the patient is a routine patient attending emergency department, they will come to building A uh, as, soon as, uh, as long as they don't have the COVID symptoms. But if the patient with COVID-19 suspected symptoms or referred from other hospital, so they will come to the building B. And then they will entrance, enter the, the building and we do the first free triage. What, uh, what will we do to the patient on the first triage? We check the symptoms, we check the vital sign, we check the history of travel, we check the history of contact, we check the any comorbidities, illness, COVID-19 testing, and then uh, so we decide whether this patient's, um, and then next, yeah. This is the step two. After we do the pre triage, we do the um, uh, uh, distribute the patient, whether the patient is suspected COVID-19 cases, it is yes or it is no from the building B. And also from the building A, unlikely COVID building, uh, we uh, put, we decide whether the patient is suspected COVID-19 cases is a yes or no. If a yes, so the patient moves to the building B. If a no, so the patients move to the building A. This is the first step. And then we do the second step. The second step is we use the cohorting system. So we decide only by using the anamnesis, uh, physical examination, and laboratory. But we haven't done the uh, PCR test swab. So on the second step, we, we use the porting system. I mean, between the patients is more than two meters using mass and etc. So, and then we use the buffer room. We do the test MSCP, and then we do the swab PCR with the quick result to decide this is COVID patient or not. If this is COVID patient, we remove the patient from the building A to the building B, or we move the, if not, it is not non-COVID patient, we place the patient onto the building A. And then we trace the patients um, according to their severity. It is a mild symptom, moderate symptom, severe symptom, or clinical or critical symptoms. We put on the uh, ward or on the ICU. This is, I mean, by two steps uh, uh, protocol trials, two step trials protocol for the COVID-19 in, in our emergency department. So this is um, how is the procedure that the patients come to. Uh, Universitas Erlangga Hospital, step one, there's a triage using two steps protocol, and then we do the zonation and examination. And then the third step, there's a team discussion. There is team discussion is 24 hours per day, seven days a week. 
it's a multidisciplinary discussion in the group. There's a pulmonologist, there's an intensivist, there's a cardiologist, there's an inter internal medicine, and so on. Almost all the department join there. Each cases we discuss together to decide between to decide whether this case is COVID or non-COVID, and then to decide what is the uh, treatment uh, appropriate for this patient, and then uh, the patient hospitalization or we even come to the work and uh, continue by Dr. Prastuti to treat the patient. So this is of the COVID-19, one of uh, the example picture, one of our room, COVID-19 emergency ward. This is one. And also, because we know that the, if we, our healthcare workers, too much exposure to the patient uh, COVID-19, it can be harmful for them. So we also, um, join with the uh, ITS. ITS, I mean, is a university for engineering, uh, university special for engineering to engineer uh, the RAISA. RAISA, it means Robot Medical Assistance, ITS and Erlangga. It is uh, joined uh, between the Erlangga University and the ITS University, University of Engineering, to build this. And the RAISA, or Robot Medical Assistance, it is uh, 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 this the uh, revision one. And we have uh, the edition two, edition three, and so on of the RISA. Uh, so it can work, it can communicate communicate with the patients. And the newest newest thing is it can check the patient saturation, it can check the uh, patient temperature, and so on. So uh, the healthcare worker don't need to much exposure with the patients of COVID-19. I hope that this can uh, reduce the uh, effect of the COVID-19 to the, our healthcare workers. So how to get our emergency department ready for COVID-19? Uh, this is the, the most important thing and the most difficult thing to, uh, to do is we have to prepare our staff, we have to prepare staff, we have to prepare space, and we have to think about the systems. Um, it is very hard jobs. It, is, it needs a lot of effort, it needs a lot of resources, and it needs a lot of money to build uh, our emergency department and to build our uh, cloning hospital to facing the COVID-19 pandemics. This is the steps, but maybe uh, my friend or can read by their own. Okay, I think that is uh, end of my presentations. I hope uh, uh, you can uh, enjoy my presentation and thank you for everyone. Thank you for the doctors, thank you for the nurse, thank you for the all of the medical medical workers. Uh, I hope this pandemic uh, will soon uh, as soon as possible. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon. Oh, thank you very much, Dr. Prihatma. Uh, all speakers have presented their uh, presentations. So now we'll move on to discussions. Uh, we'll we'll look at the chat. There's. Already so many questions. Uh, first from Dr. Alfian, pulmonologist from Universitas Erlangga Hospital. For Dr. Cheng, uh, we have six questions for you. Uh, first, do you still use rapid tests for screening of COVID-19 patient patients? And then second one, is it allowed for confirmed COVID-19 patients to choose self-isolation? Uh, if he or she are still positive. And then is there any case of reinfection in Taiwan? Fourth question is, uh, how about the prolonged positive of COVID-19 patients, uh, which can uh, prolong until one until two months? And then if, is there any health workers that infected with COVID-19 in Taiwan, or even is there any mortality of the health workers in Taiwan? And sixth question, uh, what is the effective effort of the Taiwan government to decrease the cases of COVID-19? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Six um, question first. So the question one, um, so we don't use the rapid test to screen or to diagnose COVID-19 in Taiwan uh, because uh, PCR test has higher sensitivity and the specificity. And the rapid test, uh, they are rapid but uh, the detection 
is lower, in, especially in the lower disease prevalence area, such as Taiwan. So uh, we have uh, uh, the PCR test capacity is, is, is no problem in Taiwan. So we, also, we still use the PCR as golden standard diagnosed tool. And the second is about the isolation Uh, isolation policy. So um, we follow the Taiwan CDC, uh, the guidance, the rule of Taiwan CDC. So every uh, confirmed case, they have to stay in hospital until their uh, PCR tests are negative. So uh, they cannot uh, self isolation at room, at home. And the third one's about any re reinfection cases in Taiwan. No, so we don't find any reinfection case in Taiwan. We have some cases their PCR might be uh, equivocal, such as may become negative and then weakly positive, especially in the late stage of the disease. That is because the lower, the lower uh, virus DNA in their nasal pharynx so the test might be negative and then become positive, weak, a weekly positive, and then become ne negative again. So it's not a reinfection case. And uh, the number four is about the prolonged positive PCR until one or two months. Yes, uh, we have uh, several cases. They the long the longest positive PCR duration in Taiwan is eighty. I think it's 83 days, but uh, in most of the studies in the world, um, the virus, the viable, the viable virus usually cannot be detected after 10 days. So uh, even though some cases may have longer positive PCR duration, but I think uh, they are not, they have no the ability to transmit the disease, especially after 10 days. And number five is uh, how many healthcare worker? Okay, uh, I think there are five to six healthcare workers get infected in Taiwan and there's no mortality in the healthcare workers. Number six is the uh, Taiwan government uh, effective effort. Okay, I think there are many strategies that are important. The first one, is the early, I, 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 I think the early, very early deployment of the policy is very important. We started to do a border control very early in the epidemic. We start to prepare for the medical devices such as surgical mask uh, in the very early stage of the, 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 the epidemic. So nowadays, as every citizens in Taiwan can purchase surgical mask uh, I think it's 10, 10 masks in two weeks. So almost everyone have a new mask every day. And um, we have very strict border control and our government had very strict uh, quarantine policy. So every uh, visitors uh, come to Taiwan, they have to be quarantined at quarantine hotel or at their home. And our public health system will monitor, they actually um, follow our quarantine policy in the two weeks. And the third, I think is our public awareness. So uh, maybe this is the, the, the impact of the SARS outbreak in 2003. So every citizens are very awareness about the, the um, infection uh, control and the epidemic information about the COVID-19. So uh, you can see there are more than 90% of, of citizens, they are wearing masks on the street in Taiwan. So I think uh, all these uh, strategies and the public awareness uh, is the major uh, effective effort uh, to, to uh, slow down and put down the, the COVID-19 cases in Taiwan. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Chang. Um, next, 
Questions to Miss Jenny. Uh, how many beds uh, and ICU and also ventilator for COVID-19 patients in Changgeng Memorial Hospital? And also, how's the condition nowadays? Uh, is it still full with COVID-19 patients? And the second question is, is there any separate room between non-COVID patients and COVID patients for hospitalization? Or do you different them by separate buildings? Okay, uh, I can answer the question because this is the, the, the clinical uh, issues. Okay, okay. okay. Um, okay. Uh, we have, I think we have about 100 uh, internal medicine ICU and ventilator in our hospital. So if we have more cases, we can uh, recruit the surgical ICU. So probably we have over 20 hundred ICU beds and the ventilators in Changgen Memorial Hospital. And um, okay, nowadays we only have, I think we have three to four COVID-19 cases in our hospital now. And because uh, we are the referral centers in Taiwan, so uh, mostly the more severe case will be transferred to our hospital. But those with asymptomatic or very mild symptoms they will not be transferred to Changgeng Memorial Hospital. Okay, uh, the second one is how to separate room between non-COVID and COVID patients. Um, we have a, a designated uh, ward at a certain floor. For example, we set up uh, the isolation ward at the 13th floor of our, of our building. And um, if the patient will be tra transferred from the outdoor, outdoor quarantine station to the isolation world, we have a, a designed a, a, a specific route that is majorly outside the hospital. And they can uh, enter a certain entrance. So before they uh, go through the entrance, our security will clear the route and uh, make sure there is no other patient, no other visitors around that. So they go through the, the entrance and uh, use an designated uh, elevator to the floor 13. So uh, the patient movement uh, will be uh, designed and independent and will control the routes. But uh, if we have more cases, probably maybe uh, over one, 100 or 200 cases and set up the, the isolation wall uh, between different, maybe we have, we all have to design it at an independent building. That is uh, possible. But I think the policy is dynamic. Currently, we only set up at a, a certain floor. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Cheng. Uh, next question is from Rizky Amalia to Dr. Prastuti. Um, what is the doctor's response regarding the lack of public trust in the government in dealing with COVID-19. As we all know, more and more victims are falling and people are starting to abandon the health protocols uh, and also losing faith to the government. Right. Uh, it's a very intriguing question, actually. Uh, the best that we can do right now is to keep promoting health protocols to the, uh, to the uh, as, uh, to the community. How to do that? Uh, we have our uh, doctors, uh, medical doctors in the local healthcare facility. So I think that they, they can do a more uh, prevention program for the uh, community. As for the loss of trust of the people uh, for the government, then Actually, we cannot actually do something about it. It is something that I think the government needs to further, further uh, encouraging the people to do the health protocols. Uh, it is very difficult to, uh, for our country because uh, our country is very social people. Our country has a very warm heart uh, persons 
and they have to socialize with their families. They have to socialize with their uh, neighbor and so on. So it is very, very inconvenient for them not to, not to trust everybody. That is our uh, problem. Uh, it is maybe very difficult for us to change the uh, to change the culture, but I think that we can try to at least to uh, promote the health protocols. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Prastuti. Um, next question also to Dr. Prastuti. <laughs> can you share how about the effort uh, from Unitasarma Hospital? to decrease the mortality of COVID-19 hospitalized patients, especially in uh, intensive care unit. Yeah. And also, uh, do we still use rapid tests to screening COVID-19 or we use CT scan uh, imaging? Yeah. Uh, there are a lot of things that we, that we had done to decrease the mortality rate in the ICU. Um, every every uh, new recent medical approach uh, we have already implemented in the ICU. But the patient that is being referred to us uh, is very, very in a very severe condition, very severe ARDS. Um, and most of them died before 48 hours of their arrival. So it's very, uh, there is a, it's very difficult for us to maintain a, a low uh, death rate, but we we have we will try. We we can we can try a very different aspect. We now we uh, implement the uh, plasma convalescent, which is which has a positive result, and the uh, IVIG and the uh, anti IL six. We have uh, we, we we can check the IL six uh, in our lab, which is a uh, second lab in the Surabaya, which can uh, check the IL six level. But the problem is, uh, 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 not all of the patient can be treated with the same treatment. You see. Uh, for example, the plasma convalescent is not always ready, and the aptamera is not always ready. It's very, very difficult to obtain uh, because of the overwhelming patient come to us a day. Uh, right now, we have a seven patient in the ER, seven uh, patient in the ER that is not yet have a room for them. Uh, very, very, uh, there are a lot of patients. so. We will try. We will try to keep the uh, mortality rate low. What is the second question again? Uh, is it do we still use rapid tests, or right. nowadays we right. change the CT scan thorax for uh, COVID nineteen patients? Actually, the serology is not uh, mandatory. We use a PCR, and we use the clinical finding and even the chest X ray to diagnose patient with. COVID-19, uh, we don't really use the serology uh, testing because as, uh, as, doctor, as doctor says that uh, the okay. sensitivity of the uh, serology test is very, very low. Uh, usually patient who come with a serology testing is being revert from another facility to us uh, with Okay, this, this kind of serology, uh, uh, our government still still implement the serology testing to separate between the uh, probable COVID and non-COVID. So when the patient first come to us, uh, they will present us, okay, this is my serology uh, result. I'm negative. They thought that it is negative, but they, they have pneumonia. So this, if, if it's persistent, uh, we have to research, receive the patient into the buffer room first to, to have a, a PCR, PCR or swab result. 
Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Rastuti. Next for Dr. Priyatma. Do you have ECMO in your hospital? What's your opinion about using ECMO in COVID-19 critical ill patients? Yeah, uh, ECMO, ECMO means extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. Uh, we use ECMO if the patient got the severe respiratory problem, which cannot be handled by the ventilator, and the pay or the patient got the severe hemodynamic problems, which cannot be handled by the fluid and vasopressor, anodrop, and so on. Uh, in this hospital, in Universitas Erlanga Hospital, we don't have ECMO, but there is another hospital, uh, and I work there also in uh, Dr. Sutomo Hospital. It's also the referral hospital for East Java uh, of Indonesia. Uh, it has ECMO. And uh, from the review or from the article, we see that from the Wuhan, China, uh, they say that the ECMO is the high effort, high budget, but low gain. Uh, for the patients or the, for the critical patient of COVID-19. But we are trying to use it uh, for the severe or the critical patient of COVID-19. And we still collecting the data, whether the ECMO is uh, high gain or low gain to increase the prognosis of the patient with COVID-19. So we don't have it in this hospital, but, but we have it in other hospital in this uh, city, in Surabaya. Okay, and then uh, can you share your experience how to screening COVID-19 patients before they perform surgery? To perform surgery, we have two different uh, operating theater. There is a non-COVID operating theater and there is a COVID uh, operating theater. We still use the two steps protocols, but uh, before they do the surgery, the, all of the markers, all of the markers from the analysis, from the clinical examination, from the rapid test, and the, from the swab, it has, it has to be negative to perform the operation on the non-COVID operating theater. But if the swab or the maybe the clinical symptoms, uh, there is a probable COVID or confirmed COVID, we do the operating procedure on the COVID-19 operating theaters. Okay. And how often COVID-19 confirmed cases admitted to building A, non-COVID uh, yeah. building? And why did it happen? And what did your team do to prevent this condition? Um, I don't know. Maybe yeah. Dr. Rastuti yeah. has the exact number, yeah. but it yeah. is a problem of the yeah. sensitivity and specificity mm -hmm. of the test. So we use the anamnesis, we use the clinical examination, we use the rapid test, we use the MSCT, and use the swab PCR test, but there is uh, still a COVID patients which come or enter the building A or the non-COVID building. Maybe the uh, no, percentage of the doctor can yeah. answer. Yeah, uh, that, that is a big problem because not all the patient uh, answer truthfully. Not all the patient uh, on, uh, they're honest about their condition. The best thing that we can do is to put them into a buffer room. Once the swab is come out, then it's a negative, then we will transport them to the uh, non-COVID building. It's a problem too in the uh, outpatient clinic, our outpatient clinics. So, uh, not everyone who come into our outpatient clinic receive a swab, right? Uh, that is why uh, in, the, in the beginning of this pandemic, we often have a COVID patient in our non-COVID patient outpatient clinic. But this is uh, avoidable right now. Uh, we are thankful that we have used the swab method and the clinical uh, finding uh, and C, uh, chest x-ray uh, as the early diagnostic tool for the patient who comes to the outpatient clinic. So nearly 0% patient come to the outpatient clinic with a COVID patient in the non-COVID facility, okay. in the outpatient clinic. Okay. And next, how many health worker in your country suffer from 
COVID-19? Yeah. Uh, still a question to Dr. Brahma? Uh, yeah, unfortunately, there is a lot of medical or health workers uh, die because of the COVID-19 in our country. From the data five days ago, there is a uh, 342 medical workers or healthcare workers dies because of the COVID-19 infections. Uh, from the 342, it's 192 doctors, 14 dentists, and 136 nurses. So there is uh, so many healthcare workers that uh, become the casualties of the COVID-19. Thank you. Okay, uh, and then there's one question from Dr. Chi Swanto, I guess. Question to Dr. Cheng. I read the data of Taiwan CDC on December 9th, 2020, that total cases 720 and total death only seven patients. The last COVID-19 patient death happened on last May 29th. Uh, it means there's no patient death in the last seven months. My question are, what factors contribute to this low prevalency of COVID-19 in Taiwan? Second question is, what are the key points that contributing to this low death rate, even there's no death in the last seven months? And third, uh, does the government of Taiwan follow the WHO's technical guidance in fighting to this global pandemic? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, about the question one, as I mentioned uh, in the previous questions, I think uh, the early border control and uh, our uh, whole society uh, face mask wearing uh, and the higher uh, disease awareness of the public, I think is the major factors that contribute to the, the lower disease uh, prevalence. And the second one is the key point that contributing to the lower death rate. Uh, there are several um, factors that uh, contribute to the low death rate. The first one is our uh, infected cases are mostly young people, mostly young people, uh, because uh, the most of the cases are our citizens. Uh, majorly they are students. They are uh, studying at the, at the uh, Europe, at the uh, United States. And they came back to Taiwan. They are more, mostly young people. And the other group is the uh, called the foreign workers. We have some foreign uh, immigrant workers. They come from the Southeast Asia, uh, Southeast Asia. And this group are also very young people. So because we don't have a community spreading disease, so um, we don't have any nursing home residents or the, the old age people in the community get infected. So I think uh, the, the relative younger age of our case is the first one, uh, the first key points. And the second is about, I think it's the, the sufficient medical care uh, facility, medical care. Uh, we have very sufficient medical care energy. That is because our low disease prevalence. So we have a sufficient ICU ventilators and the ECMO and also the healthcare workers. So we have, I think we can provide a very uh, strong supportive care system. And the third, I think is the, the, the more we understand in the COVID-19 management, especially uh, after the, the first wave of the pandemic. So we use the antiviral agents at the early stage. We use steroid or the anti interleukin 6 uh, Asian uh, at the late stage. So the more we understand in the disease, the, the, I think the, the better outcome we, we treat patients. And the third is about, uh, does Taiwan follow the WHO guidance? I think, yes, we, we do follow the WHO guidance. And we even go, go before the guidance because uh, we have very strict border control, very strict quarantine policies. So I think, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Chang. Um, there's still a question for Dr. Chang and also Dr. Prastuti. Uh, how, how's your opinion about active swap reform for community settings in your each country? 
Maybe Dr. Cheng first okay. can answer the question. Um, we have um, we have uh, a massive uh, serology test in Taiwan. It's about uh, I think it's in May or 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 April. Uh, there are over five thousand citizens uh, have tested for COVID nineteen antibody test in the in the western district of Taiwan. So um, the positive rate is only four cases, four cases in 5,000 tested. So the disease prevalence in terms of serology is only eight in 10,000 cases. So um, our community prevalence rate is very, very low in Taiwan. So uh, we don't, our, our CDC also do not recommend an active swap for the asymptomatic cases in our community. But if the immigrant is, uh, for example, uh, the foreign workers or our citizens come from uh, the high prevalence area, uh, the Europe, uh, the United States, or the South, uh, Southeast Asia, um, for those come from the high prevalence area or countries, uh, we will uh, do the active the swap for this kind of uh, cases. Thank you. Heard of the Chang, and also a question: uh, Is there any ECMO in your hospital? Any more? ECMO, ECMO, extra yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. I'm so sorry. You have mentioned about the ECMO. Sorry. I'll move on to Dr. Prasuti, maybe for the action. Uh, no. Uh, no swap testing swap. Okay. So in community. Testing swap. All right. Uh, maybe. Uh, I think that is very good if we if we have a uh, swap testing for the masses in Indonesia. But I suppose that if the uh, swap is done, then almost all of the population will become positive right now. And most of them are without, uh, without uh, symptoms. And what about the isolation? We have to think about uh, the solution first. Uh, the, the swap is for the for the population is maybe very uh, financial consuming for the people and for the government too. There are a lot of people needs to get a swap, and we have to consider a lot of things before we do this swap. But I think that the most important thing for us is to keep uh, the health protocol, keep wearing your mask or and so on and so on. And it's not a swipe because if it's done to most of the population, it will get a positive result. I'm positively sure. <laughs> okay, thank you Dr. Prasuti. And last question, I guess. Uh, to all speakers, how how is your opinion about facts in COVID-19 in your country? Maybe Dr. Sheng first? Yes, I think uh, every everyone, every country looking forward to the, the vaccine, the efficacy of vaccine and the availability of the vaccine. Um, because um, after one year's pandemic, uh, even though the even in the most severely affected countries and area, the, the serology test, uh, the positivity of terrarity test is not, I think it's not, uh, it's not uh, over 50 or over 60 percent. So, um, so it's still lower than the herd, immun herd immunity requirement. So um, a vaccine uh, is very important for the whole society to get back to the normal work. So I, I think Taiwan will get vaccine uh, probably in the second, second quarter of uh, 2000 
21, I think is in the second quarter of 2021. Thank you. Okay, thank you uh, to Dr. Prastuti and also Dr. Priyatna, maybe, about the vaccine for COVID-19. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we are waiting for the uh, vaccine launch right now. I think that it can be one of the solution of our problem, but uh, we're still uh, waiting for the uh, pulmonologist and uh, pulmonologists of all around the countries and internists from all, all around the countries. Basically, if the uh, doctor's collegium is agreed, then why not? Yeah, it's one of the solution in the country right now. Yeah, I guess we're still waiting for the official statement for us to get the vaccine uh, distributed. And also, <laughs> there's still another question. How do we ensure the rapid and ethical development and delivery of vaccine and other drugs and with proper supervision? I don't really understand the, the, the purpose of the question actually to all speakers, but maybe uh, it's uh, about the vaccine, whether how do we um, ensure the delivery of the vaccine to the patients and also maybe how to rapidly uh, watch over the development of the fashion afterward. Maybe Dr. Cheng have more um, experience. experience on this. <laughs> so uh, maybe I, I can I cannot answer this question. It's, uh, it's beyond my, my experience. So um, it's also maybe the coordination between government and the, the pharmaceuticals. But, so I, I think I cannot answer this question. Okay. Yes, maybe do the yeah. any yeah. um, any other addition? Maybe we we have to help another webinar for the <laughs> microbiologist. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm not helping. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess uh, uh, what we can learn from the Taiwan is that the governmental and also the the hospital and also the the, the people are all working together to to ensure that this COVID nineteen is uh, can be uh, decreased down for the locally transmitted cases. Uh, I guess that's the important key of of controlling the cases of the COVID nineteen mm -hmm. preventions. Okay, and is there any question to the Changgung Memorial Hospital? Maybe uh, I still have a question. Maybe Dr. Chang, uh, for the operation patients, uh, what do you do for screening? Patient, as as I know, the plastic surgery department in Changgung Memorial Hospital is pretty uh, well known for Professor Wei work and also Professor Chan work. I guess what's the uh, screening procedure uh, for operation in Changgung Memorial Hospital? Okay, uh, if, if the patient have any uh, emergent uh, surgery uh, indications and. Uh, we will first screen uh, about the symptoms and their uh, chest X-rays. And if he have any symptoms or any pulmonary infiltrate on the chest X-ray, we will do a PCR test before the surgery. And the second is about if, if the patient is just come from uh, the overseas, he just uh, enter uh, Taiwan, it's still in the quarantine, 14, eight, 14 days quarantine period. For this kind of situation, we will also did we will also do a PCR test before uh, the surgery. Okay, that's our policy. Okay, thank you very much for the chain. Is there any other question from Umza Salangas group? No, I think it's enough. No, I think that yes. Uh, thank you to all the speakers. Uh, Ms. Jenny Wang, Dr. Cheng, and also Dr. Prasuti, and also Dr. Brihatna. All questions have been answered, uh, and we conclude that this uh, prevention must be a correlation between the governmental, the, the people, and also the hospital in work to decrease the locally transmitted cases. Okay, thank you very much for our honorable guests and speakers from Changgung Memorial Hospital. Uh, we can give a round of applause and also from speakers from Universitas Erlanga Hospital. We may have a screenshot for uh, 
documentation for the sessions. So maybe everyone can turn on their uh, camera right now. Okay. Maybe everyone can turn on their, their camera. Okay. Okay. Three, two, one. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for uh, all the speakers and also the attending uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen on this afternoon sessions. Uh, thank you very much and hope we can gain something from this session. Uh, thank you very much for your participation. Uh, thank you very much for everyone in Changgeng Memorial Hospital. Hope we can see you everyone soon. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, okay. Uh, I give the mandatory to the MC, Dr. Priyastami. Mbak Sandi. Sharing the session and discussion so nicely. I'm sure you can benefit from all of this. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, cooperation. And I would like to remind you, have you... Um, Fill up for the um, the present uh, the present list. Bagi ibu dan bapak uh, dokter sekalian yang mungkin hadir dan uh, masih berada di situ, kami mengingatkan untuk mengisi uh, uh, absensi untuk peserta, begitu ya. Mungkin itu saja uh, untuk hari ini. Terima kasih banyak. Semoga bermanfaat. Terima kasih uh, sekali lagi kepada. Uh, moderator dan seluruh pembicara. Thank you very much for Changgung Hospital. We'll see you again and hopefully we will collaborate in more more events and we can uh, further expand our cooperation to um, research and also education. Uh, see you again next time. Bye-bye. Stay healthy.